You worked on Speed Racer, which I absolutely love. And this, every time I talk to you, I try to bring up something. I want to bring up Speed Racer today. Sure. One of the things that I love about that movie is that they, the Wachowskis made a live action cartoon. Everything's in focus in the frame. And a lot of people don't realize it, but can you sort of talk about what it was like working on that project and the fact that there were some great people that have now gone on to have their own careers who also worked on Speed Racer? Oh, are you kidding? Yeah, a ton. Um, look, when they first, when they first, we had just got done with all the Matrixes and we had done Vendetta at that point. Um, and the Chassis came, hey, we want to do the live action version of, of Speed Racer. And anybody from the same generation that we're from is like, oh, my God, Racer X, that's the coolest character ever. So we, you know, obviously being some people, uh, I was still partnering up with Dave Leach at the time. We still were running our stunt company, 8711. So we're just like, oh, my God, Speed Racer, what, what are we going to do? Where are we going to shoot this? How many cars are we going to need? But, and we had talked to the Wachowskis and it was like, well, we're thinking about, you know, doing this in a very anime look. Um, almost with different layer, like these big composition shots, but we might need some real driving. Like we we're scouting the Italian Alps, Swiss Alps, Monaco, all these great places that you do driving. And, you know, by the time we get done with all the, the VFX uh, theoretics on it and stuff, we're like, okay, well, we'll use motion based systems because we wanted to move the background and stuff as well. Um, so it became a much different kind of movie, more technological movie than a practical which is super interesting to us at the time because we had done so much practical. So we ended up shooting in Berlin on the sound stages there at Babelsberg. And when they, you know, we started having these big concept meetings about how we were going to do it in terms of, there's always at least four layers, right? Your foreground, just because you want to keep infinity focus and you want to do all the wipes and stuff, you go to the slide-ins. So there's the first unit that does all the main right in your face stuff. There's the second unit, the, the background or second tier cast layer, or like as the cast is walking it back, depending on who that would be in the blocking. Third tier would be, you know, the dog, the chimpanzee, the animals, all the action stuff. And then they'd put in the fourth layer, which is the VFX blue screen environmental stuff. So four layers, four different versions of comps, depending on where the cast would go, who was in what layer, four different directors to handle it all. And, you know, an amazing VFX department from John Gaeta and Dan Glass that would put it all together. And, you know, when you first hear that, and you're like, what? I'm sorry, play that back. What, what, like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, we're going to shoot each scene three or four times in different layers and we're going to stick them together. We're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> but then we get there and we start doing the process. I think I learned more, you know, having come from second unit, you deal with a lot with VFX, you know, it's not just stunts. You have to learn how to composite, put things together, how to use blue screens effectively, and really what, what um, you know, how to run a plate unit, just really how to stitch movies together from the VFX and practical side. And what I had learned up to that point was pretty significant. We were fortunate enough to work on some very big budget and very large productions that used enhanced VFX in the combination with practical. But Speed Racer kind of put them all to shame because now you had to think, very much three-dimensionally and how we were wrapping around and anticipate you had to do your homework every morning with the other units were shooting we'd meet with the wachowskis they'd give the goals they'd have to block it and then we'd be reactionary to what they wanted then we have to go back two or three times to get it right it was just uh, i i think some people would have thought it arduous and tedious but we were just oh my god every day is a challenge to try and it's like a puzzle every day you walked into the root cube and you're like okay what do we have to do so after a couple of months of that, I, I don't know, it was one of the most challenging things we got to do. And it was one of the most, I guess, experiential things. I mean, we're learning every day. And, you know, sometimes movie making can be a little tedious, you know, wide shot, medium shot. Hopefully you don't think that, but some do. This was every day was like, okay, I'm gonna have to relearn how to do this. And you walk away after that, and then you see it all come together, which is an entirely new experience when you see editorial and VFX put it together. Uh, again, I think you can interview Dave the same way, and it was just a massive, massive learning curve, which helps benefit today, because now you can actually, you know, one of the things one of my mentors always say, said to me, if you want to be a good director, you have to speak several languages, and they don't mean cultural languages, they meant you have to speak art design, you have to speak production design, you have to speak cinematography, you have to speak, you know, acting, you have to speak lighting, you have to speak props, you, you have to speak, it can't just go, give me my vision, that doesn't do you. Do you it to other people? In your head, you see a tree, but when you say, I want a tree, there's a million types of trees. Everyone's got a different one in their head. You know, if a stunt guy comes to you and goes, hey, what do you think of this shot? They're not asking what you think of the comp. They're asking you, 
you know, what do I need? Do I need a stunt double? Is it going to be wire work? How are we going to cut this? So I like, you know, when a wardrobe person goes, you know, blue, they're like, okay, is that going to kick? You have to speak their language. And that's how you become a more efficient leader. What we learn on Speed Racer is to speak a very high, highbrow kind of VFX compositing and filmmaking, which today, literally on every WIC I do or every other project I produce on, allows me to be a little bit better of a director and a filmmaker. So thank you to Speed Racer. I don't think I've ever learned as much in such a short period of time. Uh, thank you for sharing that story. I love that movie. And, um, I, you. you know, it's just, it's just such a great film. Um, which of the things that you worked on as a stunt coordinator do you think doesn't get enough credit in terms of the stunts that you pulled off and maybe people just didn't realize like how hard they were to do or just a film that you want to sort of, you know, shine a light on? Wow. Um, I'll go two directions with you. <laughs> Speed Racer has some interesting stuff on it, but again, nothing that you really couldn't sort out, but it was a huge learning thing in, in its combination. I, I go back to like, <laughs> you'll laugh, but I go back to like the first Expendables <laughs> that I got to do with Stallone and, and Statham and the guys. Look, we, that was Jason Statham in the front of that, that C-47 you know, over Mangra Chiba. Like we were not goofing around. That was real Napoline. That was real diesel fuel. Those were real fire burns. Like every gag in that movie no matter how whack you think it is, is a practical gag. There's slight CG enhancement on some of the, the M60 rounds and all that stuff, but like the, that's, those are real big mortar blasts. That's probably the last big old school stunt we've ever done. Like you have to go back and really, I mean, they did digital enhancement to cut the guys in half with the big gun. But I would say between Rambo, the new Ram, not First Blood, but Rambo, and the first Expendables, I think between those two, Stallone insisted on practical gags. I mean, that, in and of itself, the, the amount we did and the time we did it and for practical gags with squibs and fire was, it, gives, it makes my hands shake today. It makes my palms sweaty because every day something epic could go wrong and you had to have your shit together. You couldn't just say, we'll fix it in post. We'll erase the wire. Like we're out in the middle of Thailand and you had to get it right. And that was, you know, you know, 11 stunt teams from all over the world doing that was impressive. The other thing on the other spectrum of the scale this is a, a little known movie that I, probably wasn't received all that well. I, I went in and did a bunch of work on After Earth for M. Night Shyamalan. There was one little sequence where Jaden Smith has to jump off the cliff. In the final picture, they did a ton of digital work and it looks like it was against blue screen. But for two weeks, me and one of the best aerial coordinators in the business, a guy named Tim Rigby, probably the best wingsuit guys on the planet, went to the Swiss Alps and off the Eiger. We did 14,000 foot wingsuit jumps. Pro they call it proximity flying where every jump, you know, really bad things can happen for the cameraman who has to fly with a, a 45 pound camera on his head. So you can imagine what that is as he's literally just a few meters off the wall going at terminal velocity, following another guy weaving the thing. To this day, it is the most, I even get choked up thinking about it. It's the most hair raising, most, you're on the ground just going, please don't die, please don't die. Like you've hired the best in the world, but once they leave that helicopter at 14,000 feet, they come into about 12,000 feet where they have to lead, link up against the Eiger and go down and follow each other through some of the most insane weather conditions that the Swiss Alps can offer. And when you finally see those two parachutes open, there is no describing the amount of relief of like, Whoa. it's like, it still gets me going today. And we did that over the course of, of two weeks. And I remember the day when, you know, you're checking off your shot list and we finally get footage and then you're just, well, it's still nice weather. We can go back and you just know no, we're done, we're done. And that was the biggest relief I've ever felt in my career, that we got amazing footage, whether it made the final product or not. And uh, pushed, I think we pushed the limits of what, at least in that endeavor, human beings could do. And we walked away without a scratch. And that is one of my proudest moments. So I, I'd go with those two. Both great stories. And uh, yeah, I, I, could never, I could never do these things. Just never, never. Yeah. I don't know if I'd do them again. I'm glad I did them, but I'm good. We rolled the dice, we pushed, and the universe didn't push back, so we're good. <laughs>